Well, can you hear me? Yes. Good. I have to say that it's a great pleasure and an honour and a privilege to speak to the Friends of Essex Churches in this cathedral on the subject of the classical orders. It may surprise you, but when I started studying architecture in the late 50s, all teaching about the classical orders had been eradicated from the syllabus and replaced by a very dogmatic form of modernism where real drawing, real looking, real measuring and real moral understanding had to be learnt elsewhere. And in my case, it was in the church and talking to people with Christian convictions that I began to question the self-serving dogmas of the 50s and 60s, which I had been raised in, the dogmas of modernism, which sadly has effect affected both architecture and Christianity. Now, my purpose this evening is to try and give a simple lesson on how to understand what is going on when you look at classical detail. I think rather like uh, studying flowers, you have to know the meaning of words like petal and sepal and anther and stamen and filament. And it is rather the same with architecture. There are a number of new words that need to be learnt. So be patient, but I think that it will be helpful because the more lay people understand the detail of architecture, the more likely classical architecture will continue. At the Renaissance, well, just before that, when we refer to the classical orders, we really mean what Vitruvius, who was the great authority, referred to when he gave the names Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian, which you can see here, Doric there, Ionic and Corinthian. Those are just uh, liner cuts done by Eric Cartwright in my office. But I'm going to use them as a guide to the parts and try and explain what goes on when we look at them. At the Renaissance, after the Roman uh, architecture continued, at the Renaissance, which is 1,500 years later, two orders were added to extend their repertoire, architects like Palladio and Vignola and Scamozzi and others, uh, must have felt that, although they wanted to revive Doric, Ionic and Corinthian, they also wanted something slightly simpler at one end, which they called the Tuscan order, and something slightly more uh, ornamental at the other end, which they called composite. So you might say there's five orders. My feeling is that there are only three, but it's always useful to know about the task and then use it and, and, and the composite as well. So really what we're talking about is the three orders with possibly a little bit of influence on the Tuscan. I'd also like to say that if we take into account the 2,000 years of history of the church, I would include Romanesque and Gothic architecture as variations of those five orders. Because classical and Gothic really come out of the same stable of load-bearing masonry construction. And if you're building in bricks and mortar and stone, you're learning and continuing a tradition which people have done it that way before. 
And that was what happened after the fall of the Roman Empire, and it happened again after the, uh, after the Renaissance, that um, people who were building tended to look around and see how people had done it previously. And when you analyse a Gothic structure, you will see that it has columns and arches and beams and ornament and carving, and it has all the ingredients, really, of classical architecture. So I've always regarded Romanesque and Gothic as part of that tradition. And I'm pleased to say that we can see examples of these orders and the variations in this cathedral. And I will point them out to you in due course. So let's start with the parts of the Tuscan order, which is really the simplest. I think I will have to get out a pencil at this stage, and if you can, if you can see clearly, I'll make sure I've got a pencil in my pocket. <laughs> Did you bring a pencil, Eric? Yes, I've got one. The thing to learn about, I'm glad to say I've got a trailing mic so you can still hear me, but the thing about uh, the classical details, and I'm starting with the Tuscan because it's really the the simplest, that what you look for when you look up at a capital, I mean, if a, an order is like the human body, the capital is the head, so that identifies who the person is or what the order is. And if it's Tuscan, it has two elements. I hope you can see my drawing here, but that is the part of the capital there, which we call the abacus, from all, all have Greek words, abaca, abax is table in Greek, so the abacus is, is square, and underneath is this overlow moulding, circular moulding that goes round like that. And that's the, that's the top of the capital, so that is a typical Tuscan order. And if you can, when you look for a Tuscan, just look for the abacus and the echinus, which is the overlow underneath. <coughs> Interestingly, echinus is Greek for hedgehog. And what the, uh, that world was much closer to the farmyard than we are. And so when it looked up at a Tuscan capital, it saw what was really effectively a table and a hedgehog. That was the curvature of the hedgehog going round under the square of the table. So that was, that's one of the things we need to understand when we look at a Tuscan order. Now, in addition to the capital, all the orders have what we call an entablature. Now, the word entablature gets used so differently, but that is an entablature describes one word for three horizontal elements that it supports. The first is the architrave, and here I'm going to draw on in rough perspective. If this, if this is where the, say it's supporting a beam, here's an architrave, or it goes around like this, this is on the corner, and this is a very simple, I'm, this is why it's useful to take the task, and that is the architrave. So you have an architrave, and on top of the architrave is a frieze. Incidentally, the architrave, again, if you want to remember it, again Greek, arche, great, trabs, Latin, beam, that's supporting a great beam. So when you're looking up at a column, the column is supporting a beam, which is the architrave. On top of the architrave is a frieze, and on top of the frieze is the cornice, now, ignorant people quite often say cornice when they mean entablature or vice versa, but it's important that we get the right words. This is what, what this support is a cornice, which usually has bed moulds, somewhat like this. So this is, this is the bed mould of the, the um, cornice. And then this, this is in shadow. This is part underneath. Does that... Does that 
is that easy to understand? And then the, above that is the cornice. So you have architrave, frieze, and cornice. And all three or five orders have all those parts. So that every column has a capital and a base, which is unique to that order. And then above that is the architrave and the frieze and the cornice. Now, just while I'm explaining this, I think it's worth my saying, because a lot of people don't realize how simple architecture can be, that all these moldings which we talk about, as you look around this cathedral, you can see moldings everywhere. But actually, there are really only three, well, you'll say two moldings. There's there's what's called the cavetto, which is that molding, which caves in there. There's the overlow, which is like that. So you've got the cavetto, and its opposite is the overlow. If you put a cavetto on top of an overlow, like this, you get the cavetto, and then the overlow, you get what we call a cyma. Greek wave. So once you realize that when you're looking at moldings, you're looking at cavettos or overlays or cymas. And sometimes you will get, quite often at the top of a cornice, you'll get a cyma, which we call a cyma recta, then a fillet, and then underneath it, a cyma reversa. It's just the same, but slightly smaller. So I think anyone really becoming interested in classical architecture has to know this much about orders. I mean, this is just the Tuscan order, but I shall in due course be talking about the Doric order and the Ionic order and the Corinthian order, but all the same elements are there. And it, the same with the abacus and the echinus, but the details are different, and that's what makes it different when you look, at, um, you, you look at a classical interior. So you can begin to understand what's going on when you look at a classical building. So that's the, that's the Ionic, that's the uh, Tuscan order. Um, Um, having described the Tuscan order in such detail, I wonder if you could see an example of a Tuscan order in this cathedral. Any suggestions? Uh, no. Um, the the the. The, in a way, the simplest example of a Tuscan order is in front of me, the altar. If you look at it there, you can see eight Tuscan columns, complete with capitals and bases. The capitals are like the ones I've described. And then on top of that is the architrave and the frieze and the cornice, all made in marble. So that's one example. And you notice that the column of the Tuscan order, which is usually, Palladio would, would said it should be seven diameters, is fairly stocky and always has entasis. So it's thicker at the bottom and it reduces in height as it rises. So that's one example of the Tuscan order. Can anyone think of another example of the Tuscan order in this cathedral. Well, well you, you, I've been saying that you're probably looking for a Tuscan column with the entablature on top of it, the architrave, frieze, and cornice. But actually, the columns all around us are Tuscan. 
So these columns, they take an arch. So the column doesn't only support an entablature, it also can support an arch. And here we have 12 stone Ion, uh, Tuscan columns. Some people might say they're more like a Doric column because they have more annulets under the corona, but the, they have very pronounced entasis, and that is um, another example of the Tuscan order. Um, I said earlier that um, classical architecture and Gothic architecture come out of the same stable. You notice that the Tuscan column is the thickest, the stockiest, it's seven diameters high. Can you see in this church an example of something like a Tuscan, a similar sort of Tuscan, which is very thick, and not very high, complete with a base, capital and a base. Yes, well done. I mean, in a way, uh, those columns there, you would say are Gothic, but because I've already said, I think Gothic and classic come out of the same stable, you can see again that um, the detail is not that different from what you see in a more Roman or Renaissance rendering. The column is very short and, 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 and stubby, and it, but it has a base, it has a capital, and it has an arch. You might say, well, that's Gothic, and it is. But again, the difference between Gothic and Classic is, in fact, a pointed arch is not such a difference, particularly when you're looking at the history of the tradition I uh, mention that because those were designed by G.R. Blount, who was the first architect of this cathedral, and that was touched on at the beginning, and that was his inspiration. And um, sadly, in the 70s, the uh, cathedral was um, well, almost demolished, and they, the, uh, the architects involved at the time removed the whole of this side of that original nave and a lot of the east and west sides as well. And that um, was the result of um, this, they put this large concrete uh, cathedral in its place, uh, which wasn't a success. And um, fortunately, thanks to Bishop Thomas and some very generous uh, benefactors, I was involved in the rebuilding of this cathedral. So having given that introduction um, with the Tuscan order, what about the next order, the Doric? You see here on here the Doric order it's just worth noticing as you look at it, the differences. The capital is similar to the Tuscan, but it's got, it's got more annulets under it, and you can see that there, and you can see it at the corners. Um, it has the, it has the um, abacus, and then the architrave, the frieze, and the cornice above, which it supports. Notice that it is more slender than the Tuscan, it's eight diameters usually, and the entablature is usually about two diameters high. And one of the great features of the Doric order is what we call the triglyphs and the metope, triglyphos from Greek, three thrice grooved. This is the triglyph, and between the triglyph is the metope. Sometimes it has a circular inside it, but this is, this is a square and the triglyph is usually half a diameter. Uh, the architect, architects are always working in proportions, and so if it's eight diameters high, uh, Palladio and those who formulated the proportions 
said that the triglyph should be half a diameter and the metope three quarters. And then the bed moulds, well the bed moulds are more sophisticated, it has the cyma and then a dental course, that's, it's a dental course whether it's cut or not, but let, you can see here that when they're cut they form dentals. And then the underside of the corona, that's the overhanging piece, relates or reflects the detail of the triglyphs and metopes. So you have what are called gutti from French being drop, which is a characteristic of the, all the um, Doric orders. And uh, having explained the Doric order, I wonder whether where we can find an example of the Doric order to see in this building. I should think all of you are fairly sure where you can see it. It's the main order which runs right round the inside of the building and notice the triglyphs and the gutti and the detail is more or less as I've shown. I mean these are not um, enriched, you have the straight ordinary moulding, but all the parts of the Doric order are continued all the way around the building with the Doric columns in the corner to show you how the proportion runs. And if you go outside, you will see these columns, the, the, the Doric column, which you can only really see in the, in the two corners, is the main element of the outside. They're 20 foot high stone columns all the way round these three sides of the building. So that's the Doric order. Let's now look at the Ionic order regarded by many as the most elegant. Here's the Ionic order. It's not that different from the Doric in many ways, but it's more slender, it's nine diameters high. And the big difference is that it has these Ionic capitals or volutes on the four corners and it still has the eggs and tongues, which is like the Doric order. In fact, if you put your hand over this, over the corners, you could see the elements of a Doric order already there, but they're brought into this curvature, and that is the Ionic order, which to many is regarded as the most beautiful. And I wonder if anyone can find an example of the Ionic order Again, you've got it on the east and the west windows, both, face, both on the inside and on the outside. So you've got an example to see. In a way, that's all we see of the Ionic order, which being the most beautiful order is, is a slight pity, but you can't get everything always just how you want it. But that is the Ionic order. We call that a Venetian window. That is an arch with two, two windows either side. So you get four pilasters um, supporting that window. So that brings us to the Corinthian order, which is the grandest and the most intricate. And here is the Corinthian order. Again, it's not that different from the others. It is 10 diameters high, again, it's usually two diameters for the entablature. And the capital of the Ionic is really got, the capital of the Corinthian has something of the Ionic because it has these volutes coming out of the four corners and two layers of acanthus leaves. And the height of the Corinthian is one whole diameter so that's the main ingredient and again you have the abacus which is now segmental supporting what is really effectively a, a bell upside down in stone and against the sides of it are these volutes and leaves and then in the architrave you have these enrichments architrave frieze and cornice and both the Ionic 
often, but, but also the Corinthian, have what we call medillions. And these medillions uh, fill up the space between the corona and the bed moulds. And as you see, you've got uh, medillions, and between the medillions is a square coffer. And when architects are designing the Corinthian order, they have to be frightfully careful that the medillions fit properly so that every time there's a break, there's room for a square coffer in between. So where, I wonder, can we see a Corinthian order in this building? Yes, the cathedra. That was, um, I copied a chair in the church in Florence, which had that, and I thought the bishop would like it. He seemed to agree. <laughs> and um, you have that, Corinthian. And do you notice how the, how the fluted pilaster bends forward and becomes a handrail, which is one of the liberties you can take with the orders. It isn't just a column. It can also be used in other ways. Can you see another example of the Corinthian order? Yes. There's two, if you get close to it. There's, there's a, what we call a giant order, which goes right up and has a pediment at the top. And then there's a subsidiary order, also Corinthian, which supports the impost on which the arch rests. And you can see there the triglyphs, the, not the triglyphs, the, meta, the, um, the medallions and the coffers between them. So that brings us nearly to the main point, really. We looked at the chair and we've looked at the new organ case. I think m my wish is that um, I don't go on talking because I might be boring some people, but I would be very interested or willing to answer questions. But before I do so, I just want to dwell on one point which I found very interesting. Um, really as my closing thoughts before questions, and that is about the origin of the orders. Where did they begin? Who thought of them at the beginning? And we're here thinking of, you know, we're friends of Essex churches, <coughs> we're in a cathedral, <coughs> we come from all shapes and sizes and branches of the Christian Church, which has been here for 2,000 years. But it's interesting to me that a Spanish Jesuit called Villalpando, 1552 to 1608, believed that the orders originated in the beginning and were inspired by God. And he wrote a book <coughs> Uh, giving his views, he presumably picked up things that other people had spoken to him, but I thought it was fascinating because he maintained that the tabernacle in the wilderness, which is described in Exodus by Moses, which is 15, 1500 years BC, describes the tabernacle and in the clear description of the tabernacle, there are three, uh, what it calls in the authorised version, pillars. Those pillars, four pillars, <coughs> as you enter the outer court. <coughs> Who knows, that could have been the origin of the Doric order. Having gone through into the, uh, into the area around the tabernacle, they could then see the front of the tabernacle, and there was a portico, again with four columns. And if you think that the suppliant who went into this space would probably be bringing a lamb for sacrifice or a ram, so you have the thought of the, the, the horns of the ram and seeing an ionic order which has some affinity with the horns of a ram for sacrifice, that their sacrifice will be accepted. And the third row of pillars, when the priest takes the blood into the tabernacle, 
he goes through again four columns. It doesn't describe their enrichment, but obviously that is the most important holy place between the outer and the inner place. That could have been where the Corinthian order would have been appropriate. So it's interesting that Vidal Pando had this theory. It was taken up by John Wood of Bath. You've probably heard the famous architect of Bath in 1741. And he wrote a book called The Origin of Building, which really covers all the things I've been saying about it. But it seems fascinating to me that these orders, which have been the visual image of civilized man for centuries might have had, as it were, a Christian or a divine origin. I know it's extreme to say this, and people who've, uh, I've got a chapter in my book about it in more detail, and people think I'm slightly mad, but I thought on an evening like this, when we're talking about the orders, this might be a good moment to just bring it to your attention as a possibility.